right, so welcome back. We're back. Chance Bending. JD, how are you today, man? Man, it's an excellent day. I just got a great workout up at SRLA with Dr. Pat and Jamal. Oh, you were hanging out with our friends. Yeah, man. Jamal put me through a, a lift that made me want to throw up, but I'm here, man. I love it. I love it. You're getting you're yeah, getting man. worked out these days. Uh, all right. So we have a great episode for you today. Really excited to just get right into it. We're sitting here with Jeff Chen and Sasha Zeitner. Zeitner. All right. Damn it. I <laughs> knew it. I had it and then I lost it. We were close. Sasha and Jeff. Uh, why, why don't we get it? First of all, well, how are you guys doing? Are you like excited to be here in Chance Bending Studios? I, I'm super excited. Thank you for having us. Excellent. Excellent. So why don't you tell our audience a little bit about what you're up to, and then we'll just start digging in and see where we get to. Sure. So my name is Jeff Chen. Uh, I, I wear a lot of hats. I'm a physician, researcher, social entrepreneur, but my current focus is I'm the executive director of UCLA's Cannabis Research Initiative. And we're working on history's first human studies using the cannabis plant as a medical treatment. What does it do? What does it not do? So we're trying to clear up the smoke for lack of a better pun. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And Sasha, what about you? Me, um, like Jeff, I wear a lot of hats. Uh, I've been a pioneer in this industry for far too long, a consultant. I've done it all. And JD likes to refer me to as, quote, unquote, the plug. You That's know, a fact. For That's lack a fact. of a better pun. <laughs> we also went to high school together. Yeah, there was a Very rumor true. you guys you guys went to school together. Yeah. So you you know all the things about Jordan that we all want to know about. Yeah, all yeah. the ones that he wishes no one ever did. <laughs> I think that's a bonus. That's a bonus episode. <laughs> Maybe if you're lucky. Stay tuned. Next episode. <laughs> so Jeff, fascinating topic. I think it's on everyone's minds. Whether it's because you love marijuana, whether you want to invest in marijuana, whether you're thinking about it as an entrepreneur and about making things happen. But let's let's get right to it. What what are you finding in your research? Like what what what's going on right now with what you're doing? Sure. So I think the biggest question on the scientific community's mind is what are the effects of cannabis as a as a botanical product versus the individual compounds within cannabis? So we've all heard of THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. It's the stuff in cannabis that gets you high. It's been FDA approved since 1986. Synthetic THC in a pill. It's called Marinol. FDA approved since 1986. How come we don't know about that? I never knew that. Crazy, right? And it's patients reportedly didn't like the effects. Physicians didn't like to prescribe it. And so for 30 plus years, we've had legal THC. Your insurance would reimburse for it. Your doctor could prescribe it. It was not a Schedule One drug. Um, and so the real question we're trying to figure out now is, at what point do you focus on pure THC, pure CBD? At what point do you look at cannabis, the botanical plant, as a, as a medicine, as a compound, as a product? So what are you finding? So we're finding we there haven't been any human studies yet. We're trying to push ahead and do those studies, but it's difficult, as I'm sure we'll get into on this episode. But from a handful of studies in cells and animals that have been done on this, you see distinct effects between what pure THC and what pure CBD does and what the plant extract does. And that's because cannabis has over a hundred different cannabinoids. We've talked about two today, THC, CBD, but there's over a hundred other ones. Plus there's a whole other categories of things in the cannabis plant, flavonoids, terpenoids, and these things are all physiologically active. And so you talk to some people and they go, well, it's obvious that the cannabis plant would be better for you. That's why, you know, eating an orange is better than taking vitamin C. There's a bunch of other phytonutrients in the orange. So that's what we're trying to understand this, this paradigm. Um, and it's, it's a complicated, messy paradigm that Western medicine isn't really used to, right? We like to deal with pure compounds, sin single individual pure compounds, the idea of a messy complex botanical it's it's not really part of the western medicine paradigm how hard is it uh it you know i i'm just guessing that it's probably been very challenging for someone to research like tell us what's been going on in this field for the last bunch of years and why this is so important right now 
It's, it's a great question. So despite 33 states in America legalizing cannabis, either for medical or adult use, it still is a Schedule One drug at the federal level. What does that mean? Schedule One drugs are defined as basically the most dangerous drugs in America. But more importantly, they're defined as having no medical use. So it includes cannabis. It also includes drugs like heroin, Schedule One drugs. So as a researcher trying to get federal grants and federal dollars to research the medical use of a Schedule One drug, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult. And it's been this way for half a century. This classification has been unchanged. And it's still a Schedule One. Still a Schedule One drug. So what's changed? <laughs> you know, nothing much, actually. So what has changed is that the scientific community or certain scientists are now stepping up and staking their career on this. Whereas maybe 20 years ago, you would have been a laughingstock trying to seriously understand the medical use of cannabis. So we face pretty much all of the same barriers. But the one thing that has changed is that the scientific community is starting to realize that this is a serious subject matter and that you have folks like me who are willing to kind of go out on a limb for this um, to understand what is actually going on here. That's what's changed. The sentiment has changed. You're a renegade. <laughs> 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 You're a trailblazer. So how did you find yourself in this in this field? Yeah, sure. So, you know, for I grew up in Los Angeles, right? California, the first state to legalize cannabis in 1996. And fast forward, I'm now in my mid-20s. I'm going to medical school at UCLA. And I knew nothing about cannabis. They didn't teach us about it in medical school. And despite someone having grown up in California, which again, the first state to legalize it, I knew nothing about cannabis. And if you asked me about the medical use about four and a half years ago, I would have said, eh, maybe it helps with nausea and weight gain, but everything else is BS. That's how ignorant I was. Even four years ago. Even four years for ago. For you. For me, in medical yeah. school at UCLA, having grown up in California my whole life. And so one of my patients, when I was on my pediatrics rotation, was a little girl that suffered from a devastating seizure disorder, a very rare seizure disorder that happens very early in life. And you know, each seizure is toxic to your brain, toxic to your body, right? This is She's not learning how to walk, she's not learning how to talk. This is bad, prognosis is very bad. And so we're out of options and the family starts asking us about cannabis uh, because they had learned that historically for hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years, civilizations had described how cannabis seemed to help with seizures. And we, we basically think they're crazy. We warn them that, you know, if you do this, we're going to call Child Protective Services. They might take your kid away. Do not do this. Well, lo and behold, they do it. They come back and they say, look, at least she's not getting high. We got her a cannabis product that's high in something called CBD. I'm like, what? we have no idea what you're talking about. What is this? <laughs> what? What? what are you talking about? And, uh, but to our amazement, it seemed to work and it seemed to work very well in this one case. So my mind was really opened up. The other doctors that were part of the treatment team, they got very curious as well. And so I learned that there was something in cannabis other than THC. I learned that CBD was not psychoactive. And I learned that those were just two of, again, over a hundred other cannabinoids in the plant that we knew nothing about, that never been officially studied. And so thus kind of began my journey towards really wanting to apply modern science to cannabis for the first time ever. As a, uh, you strike me as a very smart young person. Do you, did, uh, on, a, on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> were, were, when you started getting into this, like, what was the response? Like, did you tell your family? Like, did you tell friends or like, tell us how that works? Because like I said, chance spending is it, we're an entrepreneur podcast. And so much of this is like going your own way is hard and people, they don't want to hear stuff like this. Totally. So, um, you know, my parents are immigrants from China. And so for a while, I did not tell them for obvious reasons. And, in, you know, especially in my family, but in, you know, immigrant families, Asian families, like being a doctor is a very admired thing. So as I was starting to realize that my career in medicine probably did not entail taking care of patients and was probably more geared towards in my opinion, much more scalable efforts, research, you know, uh, uh, social impact, things like that. The There was a period of time where I actually had to decide to not pursue residency, which I don't know if you're familiar, but if you're, I, I'm a doctor, I have an MD, but I'm not a licensed doctor because I haven't done residency. So that essentially means I can't get a job as a doctor and my fancy, 
years of med school and being pre-med for four years in college all went out the window. I can't make a dollar off being a doctor right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you can imagine how happy they were to hear that this was the path <laughs> that I was taking, right? Um, and so for a while, they for like years, they wouldn't even, when their friends asked them like what their son was up to, they'd be like, oh yeah, he's, you know, he's like a, he's, he's a doctor, he's finishing up med school. They wouldn't talk about it. But now that's the interesting thing. I think the tables have turned because my, my mom's friends are now asking her like, hey, I'm having issues with pain and sleep. Mm-hmm. Do you know anything about cannabis? And she's like, well, let me tell you, <laughs> <laughs> my son. So now again, the environment has changed which has allowed her to, I guess, come out of the closet about what her son does. Yeah, I can relate to that. Um, Sasha knows this story well. I have an aunt on my mother's side who suffers from Crohn's and lupus. And uh, my aunt Kim, for years, everyone knows how much health problems she's battled. If you know my aunt, she's just like one of a kind personality. She's probably not even supposed to be here with us, but just the fight inside of her has kept her alive. And when you are battling diseases like she has you know she's on she was for a long time she was on close to 40 prescription pills and um a mutual friend of me and sasha's um jeff ran actually Mm -hmm. he's the first person to give me um this vape pen called as you probably already know dosist Mm -hmm. and um at first i'm just thinking it's a weed pen like all right yeah whatever, it's a weed pen, but um, doing research, well, initially when he gave it to me, he was like, yo, Time Magazine just rated this as like the number one thing in the market right now. I didn't really understand what he meant by that. I thought he meant like the weed was really strong, but what he meant was like, this is medically backed and you know, the the, uh, dose technology behind it, this, that, and the third. So, you know, seeing my aunt go through all of that, she was out here in California, California with me and my family one time, and she was really struggling at the time. So I just gave it to her, like, just try this. I mean, none of this other shit that you take works. So you might as well try it. Long story short, she's on about four four of those medications wow. now. Completely changed her life. So I'm just, and, and I say all this to say, when I can relate to what you're saying with, with your parents, because my, my, my parents are from Louisiana, the rural south, mm-hmm. where weed is looked at like, the oh, devil's you're, lettuce. Yeah, you're doing meth or something <laughs> the devil's like that. Lettuce. <laughs> so, um, needless to say, like, through my um, aunt's health improvement, like, everybody in my family are advocates now and are like, oh, yeah, Jordan knows some people that if you got a problem, talk to him, you know? <laughs> so, is Jordan's experience, is, is that normal now? Do you hear these stories every day? So, the, the answer is yes. And the, what we're all trying to tease apart is that it's undeniable that some, and I'm not discounting your aunt's experience, but there is some element of all of this that we hear that's the placebo effect, right? So take everything you hear about cannabis and some percentage of that we have to kind of discount and realize that there's a placebo effect. And that's not true. That's not just cannabis. That's anything. If I give you a sugar pill and I tell you it's going to help you, some people will report improvement. And so what we're really trying to figure out is how much of this is the placebo? How much of this is real benefit? And so for 99% of all the things you hear people saying cannabis helped them for, there's never been an official human study. So it's not that we tried it in humans and it didn't work. It's just that it's never been tried in humans because it's so difficult to do the work. Nobody's really funding this work. And in fact, there's significant forces that might not want to see this work done. Um, and so that's what we're going up against. And that's really been the way for the last close to a century of all this. So is UCLA, is this considered controversial uh, for, by, for UCLA? Um, I would say our, our position is we're not pro-cannabis. We're not anti-cannabis. We're pro-science. So in that sense, it's not necessarily controversial. Um, it's true that there's very few universities in the world that are embarking on this, but it's it's less, it's more because that again, the notion that there is medical merit here is still a pretty new notion. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's not, the science isn't controversial. Everyone agrees that we need more research and understanding. It doesn't matter if you're, if you hate cannabis or you love it, wouldn't you agree that you want to understand more of what are the health effects? Jeff, I heard you say something um, when you started your introduction, and I don't think I've ever heard this before. What is a social entrepreneur? 
oh, it's an entrepreneur that loves to go to parties, <laughs> right? <laughs> so uh, a social entrepreneur is an entrepreneur that takes, you know, the fundamental building blocks of entrepreneurship um, and applies it to, you know, uh, it can be a social enterprise. It can be a for-profit company that has a very strong social mission, something like Tom's, for example. A social entrepreneur can go and start a very impactful nonprofit, for example. So I guess where I fall is that I guess I run a non a nonprofit startup within a much larger nonprofit being UCLA. It's like pr um, providing a solution, not a product. All right. So what, what is it going to take to be successful? Like, what do you want to see happen? Yeah, what I would love to see happen, and there's a sense of urgency here. Um, what do I define as success? I define success as gold standard placebo randomized controlled clinical trials, which is the highest level of medical research. I want to see that applied for a few priority areas that I've identified where there's some promising data in animals, but there's no human studies for, for, for cannabis compounds. And the reason all of this is so urgent is that right now what is happening is pharma is coming in and they are throwing tons and tons of money developing synthetic patented versions of cannabis compounds. Um, and what I fear might happen is we might go back to the Marinol model, right? THC has been legal since 1986. And we, and we produce all these drugs that may not be as effective or may be very expensive. So, for example, a drug called Epidiolex was just approved this summer. It's basically pure CBD. That drug's $35,000 a year. It's also backed by Ma, bought by Monsanto, the mm -hmm. people who bought Monsanto. So. Wow. Wow. So, that, so, so the danger is real. Like Sometimes I hear these stories and I don't know what to believe and what not to believe. But what you're saying is that Big pharma is coming in, and yet we don't fully understand the implications of the decisions they're making. And there's a history of risk financially that we we know what they're up, like. We know they're not always up to making us feel better. <laughs> is that is that fair, Sasha? Is that is that the way you would describe it? I would say with what you know we're seeing with the opiate epidemic in Colorado, where Colorado has had legal marijuana since or legalized recreational marijuana since I would I went there in 2012, I want to say, if I'm accurate. And, you know, in that time period, we've seen significant, significant drops in opioid, opioid deaths and all of those related. Um, no car crashes, nothing crazy, no deaths, no suicides, but just a huge drastic decrease in addiction to opiates and a huge drastic and now you're coming out with all of these stories of doctors colluding to push opiates on people and to r drive up you know health insurance and medical and i jordan i know this hit, hits closer to home for us but there are just a few doctors from bloomfield health michigan the other day that were indicted on you know charges for illegally pushing you know pharmaceuticals and opiates on on their patients sasha I need you to unlock some of your gems for the audience, man. <laughs> like, it's no stretch of the imagination when she says she's a pioneer when it comes to being an entrepreneur of the weed game. Like, going to going to a little bit of your background about those Boulder days, how you were oh. in the trenches. Oh God, I uh, 18 years old, 2009 a few months after the Ogden Memorandum was lifted, and tell people what that is. The Ogden Memorandum was the piece of legislature that was only allowing a certain amount of caregivers to care for a certain amount of plants or, you know, patients to sign over their plants to that caregiver. And once that piece of legislature was removed, it basically opened up the floodgates for a profit, a for-profit business model in the cannabis industry, such as a dispensary to be created, because now these caregivers, you know, were allowed to treat more than just five patients. They were allowed to treat, met, you know, multiple patients as long as they held the registry to their card. I see. Yes. So from there, what happened? So from there and uh, that on, that's how it began uh, medicinally out there in California. It began more as a compassionate care program in 1996, which was just to help the AIDS epidemic. Um, since then, it's just been a whirlwind. I was 
gone, it's been a whirlwind of regulations, regulation changes. I started in 2009 when there was virtually no regulations at all. No one knew what they were doing. They were coming into the stores. They were dropping, you know, product that was grown in the mountains. We were packaging that up and we were reselling it. And that was before even a metric, a seat to sale system was ever put in place. That was when everything, nothing, no, taxes were pretty much no one even thought about that. And through this, you know, the past decade, I've seen everything, every, you know, into the supply chain become more established. So as a, a cannabis entrepreneur, what can you tell our audience? I mean, what, what I'm hearing, and maybe I'm wrong, but what I'm hearing is, look, we don't want Big Pharma to come in and destroy something good. There's opportunity as an entrepreneur to come into this space. Are, where are there opportunities? Are, can you tell our audience what you're thinking about in this space? It's just, uh, why I say this is that I th I'd say for the average person, they're hearing about marijuana stocks. They're hearing about big business happening with marijuana and they want to get involved. Where are you, he where are you hearing there's opportunity? Where do you think, you know, what is this for people? It, it's whatever they want it to be. You know, it's becoming a, a huge industry and so many different aspects of it. If you want to be ancillary and touch the plant, you know, or ancillary and not touch the plant, excuse me, or if you want to touch the plant and be involved in the whole supply chain process and be involved with the quality of the product and be involved with it, or there's ways to be involved in cannabis and be a tech company and be third party removed from it. So you're seeing opportunity everywhere then? Yes. Yeah. It's not too late is what I, I guess I'm asking. It's just beginning. <laughs> not but even. If you had to provide an example, like maybe two or three examples of just someone who may, you know, because, you know, like we said, our listeners, our audience, it's a lot of entrepreneurs who may be having ideas. So I, I pick your brain about this all the time. I, you have like a, a different type of view on it, but like where, where do you think someone should start? Um. Start where their passion lies. Yeah. Anyone, and anyone who's going to succeed in life, it's going to be hard, but you have to be passionate about it. And so if you're passionate about, you know, the people, your audience, who you're reaching, you're passionate of come, where your passion comes from. And that's really, you know, the question you have to ask yourself. Yeah. And, and Jeff, is it, do you feel the same way? I mean, you're, you're tackling this from the medical end. Uh, are you, do you see opportunity? Uh, you know, I, I, it feels like we're just starting to learn what's what's working and what's not. Sure. Yeah. So I think to echo what what Sasha said, you know, passion certainly, uh, experience also can help. And I don't mean experience in cannabis, but I mean what are very parallel industries or, or skill sets that you have that can just be repurposed to cannabis, right? Supply chain stuff. Maybe you were growing tomatoes before. So that's what you're seeing happen is companies that used to do really massive uh, extraction uh, for the nutraceutical space are now taking that same equipment, that same expertise, and now applying it to cannabis, for example, right? So strategic experience, um, passion, certainly. And don't discount the ancillary part, right? Like a very common refrain that's used is during the gold rush, all the miners made no money. The people that ran the barbershops, the restaurants, the whorehouses, they made a ton of money, right? So the picks and shovels aspect of this is not to be discounted as a, as a potentially very lucrative way to go about it. Now, in terms of the medical side, what's interesting is, you know, this industry started out medical, right? And then Colorado was the first to legalize adult use, followed very quickly by Washington, Oregon, Alaska, things like that. And then you saw a pendulum, in my opinion, you saw a pendulum shift where everyone in their eyes, they saw, well, you know, medical is only 5% of the population that gets a doctor's recommendation, but adult use, anybody over 21, wow, that's 95, that's the whole rest of the population. That's where all the money is. And now you're actually seeing, in my opinion, again, this pendulum swinging back where people are like, well, adult use very quickly becomes a commodity product, right? Everything's the same. Uh, obviously, there's differences, but, you know, what's the real difference between bottle of beer A and sure, B? Sure, sure. And so now a lot of people are now who went to adult use and tried to build companies there or started investing in that are now coming back to medical because they see the value in medical. Um and you know the, the the quote unquote market size of medical to go after if you really can find some breakthrough therapies or your particular product or strain or formulation really does the trick that's a customer who will pay premium 
And it's a customer who, who might be a lifelong customer. Yeah, I, I agree. So, so what's, your, <clears throat> what's your viewpoint on running a dispensary for all our dispensary entrepreneurs? It's hard. It's hard. I would say, if anything, the people are the hardest part of the business. It's your training. Your people are still viewing this as kind of a joke. It's not viewed as if you were going into a nine to five sort of office and working at a computer all day. It's you're sitting there slanging. It still has that feeling. I yeah, think you're it does. right. Like, I, as much as I tried, like, I respect everything, it still slightly has that feeling. I yeah. Agree. And bud tenders, they're not, you know, they're not being paid enough money to really do that and they're higher you're getting more you know people who have been so associated with this product their whole life because they're more knowledgeable and but at the same time they're also have those stoner connotations with them they're not there very much to sort of they're more to sell the product than they are to educate and really learn and to really dive in and see the beauties of it. If we change the name, do you think that might help? From Bud Tender to something different? <laughs> Bud Tender just rolls off the tongue. It just um, seems a little bit funny. How did they come up with that? Bud yeah. Tender, these, Bud Tender. Oh, they, okay. <laughs> yeah. that, yeah. makes, that makes sense. But the, the unfortunate thing is, again, at least in California, there's no standardized training for the Bud Tenders. Yeah. So to, for the audience members out there, do not ask your Bud Tender what they recommend for your back or for sleep or for xyz because frankly they're kind of they're not they're not really drawing from any solid standardized curriculum or, ed or education or knowledge no. so bud tender school there's <laughs> there's an opportunity <laughs> there is and yeah, if you can yeah. and if you can maybe work here's another idea work with the state make the state mandate mandatory training for bud tenders and then have your program be one of a handful certified that all bud tenders have to go through we actually did a very unofficial experiment where some of our uh, undergraduate volunteers, they went to dispensaries and they basically said, I'm pregnant. I have nausea. What do you recommend? And the bud tenders just not a single bud tender said, well, if you're pregnant, maybe you should think about not using cannabis because there's some data that shows that cannabis use during pregnancy is not, can be not the greatest for the baby. You can have lower birth weight in the offspring, not a single bud tender objected. Right? So th those are things that you might want to build into a curriculum. And again, if you can get a deal with the state where you're one of a few accredited programs, that's a lot of revenue. Yeah, of course. And I think, you know, a big aspect of it too is the safety aspect of this business and the fact that it's still all cash. So you're basically operating an all cash brick and mortar with people who are getting paid, you know, bottom, close to minimum wage and really aren't all there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that makes a makes a ton of a sense. So that's a it's a big hurdle. It's a it's a hard aspect of it. Um interesting. We talk about this sometimes too, Sasha. Combining Ben's world and your world. Um I'm gonna be very interested to see where the marijuana industry goes as it um pertains to marketing and social media. Cause I know a lot of times you have to be so careful with it. Like you'll get your page shut down. You mm -hmm. can't just be open with it. Like think about from a content perspective, yeah. a guy like you, if a big time marijuana company came to you and wanted you to blow them up online, that would be a challenge right now. Like, And that kind of goes back to, you know, what Jeff and I were saying with skill sets being applied across all, if you're, you know, if you have a great sales skill set, you can apply that across multi magnitude of industries. However, with cannabis, it is still so state by state operated that, you know, advertising in California looks a lot different than advertising in Colorado. Right. It's and it's very much a big the police, you know, there's so many different variables that go into the reason that is why. That's a great point. So there's like federal regulations around how you can advertise, right? So you can't regulate you can the FTC and FCC regulations radio broadcasts, right? You can't advertise via that. Then there's your state's particular bans on advertisements. Um, and then there's like companies who just have their own rules, so like Facebook, Instagram, they kind of have their own internal policy that are aligned with federal policy about taking down pages that are trying to promote cannabis brands. It seems like one way that brands are getting around this is through CBD mm -hmm. sort of sales and knowledge and stuff like that. Like how does someone, like I, I probably fit more into this category how if I want to try CBD, but I, there's so much stuff going on. Like, what should I believe? What should I not believe in this space? 
And I know that's not easy to answer, but I feel like there's so many people out there that are like, I want to try CBD. I understand nothing's been substantiated. How do they even think about that right now? Um, I would say their best bet to find, and I was just reading an article about this this morning too with the whole hemp bill being passed yesterday or the, being written in and all of the amazing things and progress we're making on that front. It's one of the biggest issues in this industry is lack of knowledge and being able to tell the difference between a quality product and a qual, you know, just something that's been put on the market as a marketing, you know, gist. And I would say there's for anybody who doesn't know where to start, start by going into a licensed store that has their license publicly displayed and has compliantly packaged product because you know that compliantly packaged product has to be sent through a testing facility, a third party testing facility. Whereas anything else you buy online or in a non cannabis dispensary, right? Grocery stores sell CBD, you'll find gas stations that sell it. None of that's regulated. Um, It could have no CBD in there. It could have 10 times as much as it advertises. It could have contaminants in there. So it's tough. Um, And you're right, because the margins are so high, man. These CBD products are expensive. The margins are so high. There's so little regulation. There's tons of kind of fly-by-night operations that are just trying to make a quick buck um, and just trying to put some product on a shelf to sell it. If I were to tell you the margins of CBD, it's it would blow your mind. It would from what it takes to produce it to what they sell it for in Airwans is just you. You would be signed. <laughs> You'd be sold. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. So, so with CBD, if someone should look for, is there a something on the bottle that they can look at? Like if, or is it not? No, they have to go to a licensed store. I think this is, a, I just want to emphasize this because I think it's really important. Half the audience is probably listening saying, I'm curious, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I hate that feeling of like being ripped off or not knowing what you're putting in your body. That's all. Every single coffee store I walk into, I ask them to see the bottle of CBD and I, never take it because half the time I'll be like, oh, where do you supply this from? And they'd be like, we get it from China. And and anyone who knows anything about um, the dark web and China and the whole outrage with fentanyl going on right now would probably steer as far away from clear, as far away from that as possible. So unfortunately, there there isn't anything. There's no certification stamp. There's no third party certifying entity that says the CBD product is legit, is not legit, et cetera. Um, And that going back to what Sasha was saying is the only regulated cannabinoid market out there is licensed dispensaries in legal states where there's very strict regulation, very strict regulation, labeling standards, testing standards. So if you, you know, if you're lucky where you're in a state that has that sort of access and you want to ensure that your product is, does have CBD and has no contaminants and nothing harmful, the, a dispensary is pretty much your only place to get that. Um, Jeff, um, we talked a little bit before we started shooting. T- touch a little bit, and Sasha, really, because we talk about this all the time. Touch a, touch a little bit about the marijuana industry as it pertains to athletics, because I know your research could benefit my community in a big way, obviously. Uh, I can't wait for the day that the NFL and the NBA use this for treatment. Um, and on the entrepreneur side, I know it's a lot of guys that have retired that are getting into the business. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So where this really hit home for me, well, and again, I was, I was ignorant to this. Um, it was actually a UCLA alumni, uh, Matt Barnes, who went on to have a very successful MBA career. Um, <clears throat> we got connected about a year ago and he helped me understand that it is incredibly prevalent cannabis use amongst professional athletes. It is incredibly prevalent during the active season. That's a fact. Tons of, (laughs) yeah, right? Like it it sounded crazy, right? Tons of athletes are being penalized, fined for it, all this stuff. And that was when I first was aware that this was such a massive, uh, this was happening so frequently. And what he was saying, and the other thing he made me realize is that like, Athletes are, you know, imagine an athlete on tour or on the road, right? You fly into one place, 
you got two hours of sleep, then you got to be up the next morning, start training, get ready for the game the next day. Then you're back on the road again. You're away from your family. You're trying to sleep. You're trying to wake up. You're in pain. You just got injured. All these things. And for a lot of athletes, they are very wary of taking sleeping pills and opioid painkillers and all these things. And that's why that they a lot, a lot of them turn to cannabis. And from what I've gathered, the leagues have basically turned a blind eye to this per se. Um, they're not really trying to study it or understand it. And so one thing that that we are working on right now is it would be the first ever survey. Just let's start simple. It would be the first ever survey uh, of NBA players to understand who, you know, how much cannabis are they using, why are they using cannabis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think we'll, we would all be very surprised at how high the numbers, no pun intended, how high the numbers come back. Um, and that would be the first point to have a conversation about this. About yeah. what, and, and apparently hockey doesn't test for cannabis, which is interesting, but MLB, NFL, and NBA do. But it's like a loophole. It's a loophole with the NFL. They do it where it's they basically you get one test and it's during the offseason. So it's like just pass the test and then you can do what you want to do during right. the season. Right, whereas NBA, they test you randomly four times four during times. the active season. Right, right, right. right. So. And the hockey guys just do whatever they want. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other subject. <laughs> right? Those Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> it's cold. We'll get, we'll make it a pass. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Jeff, what I'm hearing, though, is that the work you're doing is so important, right? We have this, this industry that's blowing up. We have not a lot of regulation. We don't really know what's going on. You have to have courage in order to trailblaze and make things happen with what you're doing. And here you are at one school. Are there are there other school other programs other schools? Who's funding you? How is this all working? Sure. Yeah. So when when we started our program about 15 months ago, we were one of the first in the world. Um, it is certainly becoming. There, there's you know a few that have popped up since then, but in America. Uh, there's maybe, you know, I can count on one hand the number of dedicated cannabis research programs at universities in America, right? It's still not very, and most of them are brand new, right? Um, so not very common. Uh, in terms of the the funding situation is very difficult, right? So cannabis is schedule one drug. You can get federal funding to study the harms of cannabis. So we have many of our faculty members in our cannabis program who've gotten federal funds to study the harms of cannabis. What does the smoke do to your lungs? What does it do to adolescent brain, et cetera? You can't, it's pretty impossible to get federal funding to study the medical benefits of cannabis because by definition has no medical use, right? Mm -hmm. Number one. Number two, pharma will supply funding. And we are, again, several of our faculty members are running clinical studies for pharma, but they want, when they give you money, they want to study, they want you to study their synthetic patented versions of what's in the cannabis plant and it's pure individual compounds so what nobody around the world not even in israel um or not that not much is happening is people studying the botanical product the cannabis plant the cannabis extracts and all of the compounds within it the reason that i think it's so interesting and fundamentally necessary is there's the big question of whether it works better or worse there's also the question of, could you do this a lot cheaper? Because you're working with the natural plant product, it's inherently unpatentable. Um, and it's always going to be universally accessible, democratized. So there's a huge cost issue too. And as our healthcare system is going bankrupt in America, we need to explore cheaper options. So again, that pharma company, Epidiolex, $35,000 a year for their CBD drug. There's a reason it's called weed. It grows out of the ground like a weed. With the right climate, it can grow 20 feet tall, right? That CBD is pennies on the dollar. They're selling for 35,000. And then, right? So what we're trying to do is the first human studies in history using the cannabis plant, the botanical product. And we're looking at three priority areas. So number one, we're interested in, could it reduce opioid dependence? Could it inhibit cancer growth? And could it prevent Alzheimer's? And there's animal studies that offer some preliminary evidence that it could benefit these conditions, but it's never been tested in humans. And the reason we there's an urgency here is the quicker that we can get these studies off the ground and published into the public domain, we actually prevent certain patents from being filed onto the medical use of cannabis. So there's also a certain impetus here to keep so-called keeping cannabis in the public domain, right, as a public resource. 
Um, but again, all of this is a big question mark. And at the end of the day, we've really had to, you know, we've identified that the only way for this work to proceed at this point is really through the support of the philanthropic community, through private donations. You know, the other added difficulty is we can't take money from cannabis companies because they're federally illegal. <laughs> so you knock out federal grants, you knock out pharma, you knock out cannabis companies, we're pretty much left with private donors that, that feel compelled enough to support this work. And so that's been a struggle too, is finding people who care enough about this, who see and understand the urgency and the importance of this work. And the potential. Yeah, I mean, it's, it sounds like you are truly trailblazing and it's very, very important work, right? We have so many things going on in this space and not enough you. So we have to figure out how to get this done. What's the timeline on what you're doing? How do people, if they want to get involved, if they want to learn more about what you're doing, like what, how, how does this all look? Like what does 2019 look like for you guys right now? Yeah, sure. So we started about two months ago, we started an end of year fundraising campaign. And we, our goal was to raise a million dollars by the end of the year. And we just hit uh, seven about $740,000. So we've got about- Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we got about a quarter million to go before the before Christmas. So we got about, you know, we're not, we don't have that much time, but we're, we're going for it. What do we want to use the funds for? So the whole idea here is that we need to show some pilot data. So in research, the way it works is you, you do a pilot study. If the results look good, you secure some more money and you do a much bigger follow-up study. It's the same way with a startup. You give a little bit of seed grants, entrepreneurs able to execute successfully. Now you, there's a series A, let's drop 20 million bucks in them so they can execute further. What we need to do is just show, do some pilot studies in humans in those three areas that I just mentioned, opioid dependence, inhibiting cancer growth, preventing Alzheimer's. Um, if the results look good, then we can dramatically expand the scope of the study and we can start going to the major foundations, uh, the, you know, the Gates foundations, things like that, that if you show them the preliminary data in humans, they'll give you the much bigger checks that you need to do the full study. So each one of these studies is multi-millions of dollars. We're raising the first million to just get some pilot work started in those three areas. It's not going to be the end all be all, but it's the it's the first step to kind of jumpstart this work. And we have another or I have another project on the side where hopefully will be a place that we can help facilitate some of these some of this to happen opening hopefully Q1 of 2019. Well, uh, you know, I have to say I'm just so impressed because it would be a million times easier to just become a regular doctor somewhere, right, with some HMO. It would be a million times easier not to pave the road for for so many interesting entrepreneurs like you like it, it's it's crazy to me and i think that it's a shining example of what chance bending is all about and i really mean that which is you are figuring out your own path and you're helping other people right like entrepreneuring the is the art of giving actually it, you're, you're you're providing value which is giving and i feel like you're giving to everybody right now and it's not easy when it goes down. It's so easy to talk about entrepreneuring and to be like, yeah, rah, rah. But actually when you're doing it, people just don't want to pay attention. They don't like what you're doing. And I'm just impressed. You have a lot of cool stuff going on. Thank you. Yeah, and I think what people don't realize is how freaking hard entrepreneurship is. It's like getting kicked in the face every single day. Going, waking, like waking up at four in the morning with just that pit in your like gut that you know and you're staring at the ceiling for hours wondering what the hell you're actually doing right um and i guess the way that i've kind of coped with that is at a certain point you have to god this is a, I, I feel like such so lame for saying this you have to surrender you have to surrender that <laughs> surrender to there the is flow. A, there is a greater force behind all this and so that if something doesn't work out your way you kind of have to be like oh that's cool i mean that that was meant to happen that there's that road was supposed to be cut off there so that i can make a turn and go down this real path and that's how through all the ups and downs I, I get less and less disturbed over time because i'm realizing that i don't really have control over the flow i'm floating down a river right and that river is pushing me along and the river has a current and the river has bends in it and so when i you know uh, uh get to i get a lot more inner peace understanding that and it's able to help me cope with all the uncertainty and all that all of that and i didn't mention this before i do i'm very avid yoga ayurvedic pr practitioner which is why i see you know so much potential in plants because plant ayurveda is pretty much plant medicine and i've 
cured my whole every sickness I've had my whole life with purely only standard process supplements and things you know difference like that and it's it's a beautiful thing there's so much there's so much to be learned and knowing and part of that is you know recognizing that when something goes wrong it's not because it was meant to go wrong it's because something bigger is and better is about to happen wow poetic poetic thank you guys thank you for coming today this was was really really a good one what um <clears throat> where can people like contact oh you know <laughs> great question so um if they're interested in making an an, an end of year charitable gift uh, they can go to our website uh, giving.ucla.edu slash cannabis research um, all the funds that you give go to ucla they're tax deductible and then they're earmarked for use by our program uh, if you want to get in touch with me you can also email us at cannabis at medinet.ucla.edu and you can also visit our website too if you just google ucla cannabis you'll find our website great and and anything you want to promote i you know i'm here i'm <laughs> happy to connect any any instagram we should know you know nothing, nothing. that i <laughs> i like to stay off you know yeah. no paper you're trail. too busy working <laughs> no no paper trail i find is better no. sometimes <laughs> the, the, the chance bending community will get to know sasha she'll, <laughs> yeah. she'll be back <laughs> Yeah, we'd love to have you back. We want to stay in touch and better understand what's going on. I feel like uh, in 2019, I, I'm just excited to hear what what happens with with what you're doing. Right? It's it, it really is important. And the final thing that I want to say, you brought up Ayurvedic medicine, which I think is really interesting. Um, I think there's something at stake here, which is much more than just cannabis. I think cannabis is just going to be the first test case of people looking at a botanical product very seriously and putting serious science into a botanical product um, and that paves the way for us to also take more seriously whether it's everything from whole foods to other plant-based medicines botanical products and cannabis really being kind of the again lack of a better word the gateway herb into this paradigm shift of what can we do when we're not being super derivative um, and we kind of learn from what actually already exists in nature might be that thing that makes people, you know, look, check the back of their what they're buying from their grocery store twice. Who would do that? <laughs> Who would exactly. Do that? <laughs> no, come on. Uh, Jeff, we didn't really get to touch on it, but um, at some point in the next few months, we gotta we gotta do this again and put the athletic touch on. I want to get a few of my friends. We gotta have like a full blown athlete a world forum, time. an yeah. athlete forum. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to when it pertains to. That, that beautiful plant that you're studying, man. <laughs> uh, great, great. Well, thank you guys for coming by. I uh, really appreciate it. So we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Great. Thank you, thank you Ben. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks. Thanks.